Hello, everyone. Thanks for uh, having me here. It's a cool place to be, and I uh, always enjoy being in Europe. So today we're going to talk about the maturity in the gamification industry through more white hat intrinsic designs. And um, so I think we already covered a quick background myself. Before anything, I'd like to uh, get a show of hands. Who I'm going to try to see if I can record this actually because it's a lot of fun. Uh, who has heard about Octalysis before? Okay, so feels like 60%. All right, so 60% of the audience. And um, okay, so I have been working in the uh, gamification industry since 2003, so it made me one of the earlier pioneers in the industry. I'll talk a little about my story there. Started a few companies, uh, did some uh, speaker events at, you know, like Stanford, a few different places. Oh, and recently became a, a author, published my first book, which combines the 12 years of research into the book. So um, next slide. So if you, it's on $28 on Amazon. So I'm going to be talking really fast today. And um, there's two, two parts. The first part will be just the foundation of Octalysis. And I'm going to go really quickly on that because a lot of you know. And if you don't, if you can't follow, just go to my website. But the second half would be more about how to use the framework to understand where the industry needs to go. Um, but if you, and if you want to learn more, I'll be autographing a book, 20, 20 euro, and I'll sign it back there. Cool. Next slide, please. All right. So when I started in 2003, it was a very lonely passion. You know, I started thinking that, wow, games are so engaging. I spent, I spent so much time playing the games, but then my life got nowhere. So I became really obsessed with two topics. One was, how do you make games more productive? And two was to how to make life more fun. And uh, again, people at the time didn't really understand or believe in it. They thought I was creating more excuses to play games. And, uh, but I believe in the value of gamification, using game design to influence behavior. So I stuck to it, started many companies. I know a lot of you these days are saying, oh man, it's so hard to convince these companies or like, get them to understand what gamification is. Trust me, it was way hard in 2005 to, to do the same thing. And uh, so the key is that you want to be persistent, right? If you, if you believe in the value of it, if you're passionate about it and you stick to it, eventually it pays off. Now, if you're in there for the opportunity, for the easy money, I'm, I do feel sorry for it. Not necessarily it's the easiest thing, but to me it's very meaningful, removing that barrier between what, uh, what we want to do and what we have to do. You know, I think we, if we design our lives correctly, everything we do can be fun, engaging, and exciting. So during this period, I kind of see it as building a boat or a ship that could float, right? We try a few things, you push it off the dock, oh, it sunk, that's, that's too bad. So then you try again and it sunk. So that was a period of just building that. My most uh, well-known work is the Octalysis framework, uh, which is basically breaking down motivation to eight core drives. I don't know why it keeps jumping to the next screen. Um, but the, so what I did, I spent a lot of time studying what actually makes a game engaging. I study a lot of clones of games and see, you know, these games look exactly like each other. Why is one so much successful? Sometimes the visually stunning game is, is, is a failure and the ugly game is successful. And they all have points and badges, they all have quests, but what actually makes a game successful? So then uh, I, I introduced my Octalysis framework on my site. It was really much picked up, which got me all my opportunities. And usually the the, the slide before this is, is the full framework, but it's okay. Um, so I want to quickly go through those eight core drives, just get you to understand what it is and the few cool things you can do with it. And, uh, but then we're going to go into to the main uh, original content I have for this group today. So basically, again, everything you do is based on one or more of these eight core drives, inside or outside of a game, which means that if there's none of those eight core drives there, there's zero motivation. No behavior happens. So to quickly go through those core drives, there's core drive one, epic meaning and calling, which is we're doing something because we feel like we're part of something bigger than ourselves. You know, it's epic. And uh, this is why people contribute to Wikipedia. We know they don't do it to make money, but they also don't do it to update their resumes. People contribute to Wikipedia because they feel like they're protecting humanity's knowledge, something bigger than themselves. Core drive two is development and accomplishment. So this is the drive that says we feel motivated because we feel like we're improving ourselves, we are leveling up, we're achieving mastery. And this is where most of those points, badges, leaderboards you see a lot in the industry lies, right? Points are just counters, right? It shows you a sense of development. Even though you're doing the exact same things 
over and over again, uh, you, because you see a number growing, you feel like, hey, I'm actually getting somewhere. And then badges are what we call achievement symbols, which you know, symbolizes accomplishment. Achievement symbols can be in different forms, like you know, crowns, you know, black belt, white belts, uniforms, all that stuff. But it has to symbolize, symbolize accomplishment, or else it could be insulting. Next slide. All right, core drive three is empowerment of creativity and feedback. So this is the drive, it's kind of like Lego. It gives users the basic building blocks, and there's an infinite amount of ways for them to use their creativity, try different strategies, see feedback, and then go back and adjust. And that's a very engaging process. Next. Core drive four is ownership and possession. This is a drive that says, because you feel like you own something, you want to protect it, you want to improve it, and you want to get more of it. So this goes into things like virtual currency, virtual goods. It's also the drive that makes us want to accumulate wealth or uh, do collections, collect stamps, organize your things. Uh, also, if you invest a lot of your time to customize your Dropbox folder or your profile, you feel more attached to it, hence more ownership. Next. Core drive five is social influence and relatedness. So this is the drive that says, you know, it's basically everything you do based on what other people do think or say. So it relates to things like competition, collaboration, envy, group quests, gifting. Um, it also has this relatedness piece, which are which things like uh, nostalgia. Like if you see a product that reminds you of your childhood, you automatically have a higher chance of buying that product. If you meet someone from the same hometown, you have a higher chance of striking up a deal with that person. Next. Core drive six is uh, scarcity and impatience. So this is the drive that says we want something just because we can't have it. So if grapes are on the table, we don't really care about those grapes. You might eat it you know, casually because it's easy, but we don't care. But if those grapes were locked just behind a glass shelf, beyond your reach, and you're always thinking about those grapes, you know, are they sweet? Can I have them? When can I have them? And uh, this is a core drive that Facebook utilized, next please, uh, in the early days. So when Facebook launched, it says, Facebook is only for Harvard students. If you didn't get into Harvard, too bad, can't use Facebook. Next. And uh, then Facebook says, oh, well, we're open to some Ivy League schools and some schools that your college buddies got in, but you weren't smart enough to get in, too bad. And then Facebook opened up to more schools, and basically, when it opened up to UCLA, where I was attending, 2004, Everyone rushed into Facebook because they, they, not because they knew how amazing Facebook was, it was because they couldn't get in. The exclusivity itself uh, drove people's behavior. Next. Um, and this is also a core drive that a lot of social mobile games use to monetize. So some people go into a game like Farmville and say, you know, this game is kind of fun, but I'll never spend real money on a stupid game like this. And then Farmville starts to dangle this mansion in front of your face, and you're like, oh, I wonder what I need to do to get this mansion. Oh, man, I need to do 40 more hours of farming to get this mansion. That's a lot of farming, right? Oh, but wait, I just have to spend $5, and I can get the mansion immediately. $5 to save 40 hours of my time. That's a no-brainer, right? And so suddenly you're no longer spending $5 to get uh, useless pixels on your screen, you're spending $5 to save your time. So that scarcity changes our values. Next. Core drive seven is unpredictability and uh, curiosity. So this is a drive that says, because we don't know what's gonna happen next, we're always thinking about it. So this drive is obviously heavily utilized in the gambling industry. Uh, but whenever you have a sweepstakes, a lottery system, a raffle ticket, uh, it utilizes this core drive. It's also the drive that makes us want to finish a book or a movie, and that's why we hate spoilers. And um, next, there's a lot of uh, scientific research behind uh, core drive, some unpredictable curiosity. The most famous one is the Skinner box. So for those who don't know, uh, scientists B.F. Skinner put animals in a box. And the first experiment is that whenever the animal presses the lever, or there's a lever, uh, food comes out. What you'll see there is that the animal will press the lever until it's no longer hungry, uh, and then it stops because it doesn't need food anymore. Makes sense. But when it changed the experiment to the point where whenever you press the lever, food may or may not come out, and sometimes to come out, what you'll see is the animal constantly pressing the lever, regardless if it's hungry or not, because it's just messing with its brain. Will it come out? Will it come out? Will it come out? And so you have gambling addiction right there in the little Skinner box. Now, a lot of the critics of gamification say, oh, you know, those points and badges things, it's like putting people in Skinner boxes. And that's actually not accurate because we know points and badges are about development and accomplishment. The Skinner box proves unpredictable variable rewards uh, create this, uh, this Skinner box behavior. Next. 
Uh, core drive eight is loss and avoidance, very straightforward. You're doing something to avoid a loss. You don't want something bad to happen. Next. All right, so again, this is the full chart, and there's these, all these game techniques. So I spent many years developing this framework, and I've been using it for every, and everything you do is based on one or more of these eight core drives, which means that if there's none of these eight core drives there, there's zero behavior, no motivation happens. So that's quick summary. And then there's some cool things you can do, it, do with it. I'll just quickly kind of go over quickly. So you can use it to, uh, next, please. Yep, you can use it to analyze different experiences. Oh, Facebook is weak on epic median calling and scarcity. Go next. Uh, then it's like, oh, you know, Twitter, you know, has, is strong, is pretty balanced. Next. Uh, LinkedIn is interesting because it's very focused on the left, on the left side, you know, the accomp development accomplishment, ownership, scarcity. And so you can start to analyze why experiences are engaging, what's missing. Next. And then later on, you can develop into you know, level two, which is applying it to the four, four experience phases. Next. Uh, so just understanding what core drives um, drive people in each phase. So discovery, why people start, onboarding, the rules and tools to play the game, and scaffolding the, the regular activity loop that people come back over and over again. And then the end game, how do you retain your veterans? So again, I'm not going to go into too much detail of these things. Uh, it's, a lot of that's on my website or in the book. So next. Then you can bring into level three, uh, which is applying different player types. There's five levels in total. We're just going to kind of covered level three, and then go into the point. Um, so you can apply to different player types, such as achievers, explorers, socialize, and killers, understand why dif different types of people are motivated differently at different stage. Next, so you can kind of see, oh, well, achievers at in discovery, they have the motivation to start, Onboarding feels good, but scaffolding drop out. And maybe the killers are the ones, in this case, for instance, to go through all phases. In the end game, they're showing off or killing the noobs. Cool. So, that's the framework. There's a lot of things to do with it, and I owe much of my success to, to that framework, and I've been very uh, grateful about it. Okay, so now we get to a point uh, today where I feel like the industry has taken off. I've been extremely lucky where, at one point, the industry cared about what I was passionate about, right? Because it could literally be 50 years later, 100 years later, who knows? But I was very lucky, and so pe companies saw, wow, gamification is powerful. So they looked around, and I happened to be one of the fewer people that have been doing it for a while. So I got all my a lot of opportunities, but so my analogy is now we have finally built a ship that can sail off from the dock, right? There's the economy going on, there's business, there's all these talks, amazing people, but the problem is not solved, right? Because once we have a ship and, it's, and it can finally go off the dock. Now we face the vast ocean, right? We just did the first step, and we have to understand what's ahead of us. Next. So uh, what, I, what I want to cover today, and I have uh, talked about earlier, is that the nature of these eight core drives. So uh, these, these are the, our core behavior, but based on their placement on the octang shape, they produce different results. So, on the left side, we call it left brain core drives. I guess we can do next. Uh, they're not geographically on the left side, but they represent the logical brain. So these are things you do for reward, for a purpose, or for a goal, but you don't necessarily enjoy the activity. So extrinsic motivation. Um, and a lot of us know what that means here. So the right brain core drives are more about intrinsic motivation, things we just enjoy doing, that we would even pay people money in order to experience. Now, we talked about a lot of companies like to design for extrinsic motivation because it's just so much easier to put a reward on an activity you want to see. It doesn't matter if it's money or points or badges, extrinsic reward. And the problem with that, as opposed to actually making the activity fun. And so the problem with that is that you know, extrinsic motivation has shown to kill intrinsic motivation. So let's say I love to draw, and I always draw for free. It's my passion. Science have shown that one of the best ways for you to get me to stop drawing is to pay me to do it, and then stop, pay me less and less and less, $10, $5, $1, 2, 20 cents. At one point, I will refuse to draw because I feel like it's no longer worth my time. Even though before I met you, I drew for free. So you have transitioned my intrinsic joy of drawing into the extrinsic joy or extrinsic motivation of making money. So when the money's not enough, I lose interest altogether. Next. So then we have what we call white hat core drives on the top. So these are drives that make people feel powerful, they feel in control, they feel good. The problem with white hat is that there's no sense of urgency. You take your time because you feel like you're in control. And then there's the bottom ones, you next, I guess. Uh, the bottom ones is uh, the black hat core drives. If you're doing something that, that just to avoid a loss, just because you can't have something or because you don't know what's going to happen next, it's still very powerful in motivation, 
but it leaves a bad taste in your mouth. So Black Hat creates urgency, obsession, even addiction. But again, because we don't necessarily feel good about our actions, when we can't escape the system, we will want to. Next. So I believe Zynga, the game company, their issue is that they figured out how to do all these Black Hat game techniques. And, so, and they don't think about it that way because they don't have the framework. They think about it as data-driven design. And we know because Black Hat creates urgency, when you're very data-driven, you go to Black Hat. And so because of that, all their short-term metrics look great. You know, retention, virality, uh, re uh, monetization. But because people don't feel good playing Zynga games when they can't escape, they actually will want to, and that actually makes them happy when they quit. Next. Now, just because it's called Black Hat Gamification doesn't mean it's necessarily bad. A lot of people voluntarily put themselves in Black Hat to go to the gym more often or eat more healthily. So next. So this is alarm clock where every time you press the snooze button, the wake me up 10 minutes from now button, it destroys your money. So we are now waking up because of core drive, a loss and avoidance, right? We don't want to lose money, so we wake up. But we're okay with that because we want to wake up. It's our goal. What people don't like is when companies or uh, marketers or governments use Black Hat to get you to buy things you don't need, to manipulate, to work overtime, things like that. We're probably still going to do it because, again, Black Hat is obsessive. But again, we don't feel good. And when we can quit, we want to quit. Next. All right, so what is ahead now that we understand the, the intricacies of Octalysis framework? Next. I see that there is a danger zone ahead, and it may cause an industry crash and bars me. So if it's not designed properly in terms of where it's going. So I wanted to talk about this so we can all mature more into that a design direction. Next. So if you look at the eight, eight core drives, next, you can divide it into four quadrants, and I guess next, and then. The first quadrant, again, is white hat. It's on the left top. It's white hat plus left brain, which is extrinsic motivation. And this is where the points and badge leaderboards are. So we see a lot of designs that use these things. But as we know, the risk of that is the over-justification effect. Next. Uh, so basically, when people get used to the reward or they get the reward, they lose interest altogether. And they stop doing it even from before you give them points. You know. Then next. OK, so the second one. Uh, is eventually some companies say, okay, well, let's get do black hat and left brain uh, design. So I don't want to cover these game techniques, but you add anchor juxtaposition, magnetic caps to it. The result of that, next, <laughs> is uh, obsessive short-term behavior. Because it's black hat, people are obsessed about it. They, they spend a lot of time, your metrics go up. But just like Zynga, because people don't feel good about it, they burn out. And so you'll, you'll make great ROI reports, right? Because your short-term study shows amazing returns. Everything looks great. And then people burn out. And then companies say, whoa, gamification doesn't work. It's, it's terrible. We shouldn't have done it in the first place. Bad for the industry. And then you go into the third stage, where you go into Black Hat and right brain intrinsic design. So these are more like slot machine mechanics, you know, Easter eggs, competition. And these are things that excite people, it's intrinsic, right? It's like gambling, but it leads to next. Uh, gambling like guilty addiction. It's like, oh, well, we're, we feel like we can't control ourselves. We're gambling or we're watching the soap opera. We can never stop. And we're engaged. It's fun. We like it, but we feel guilty. So oftentimes, we want to drop out, too, after a while when we can't quit because we feel like we're not in control. So eventually, I'm proposing we need to eventually move into the right top corner for white hat plus right brain intrinsic design. So um, basically, you want to give them autonomy, meaningful choices, boosters. And so at that point, it's on the right top. This is where people enjoy the experience. They like what they're doing, and it's long-lasting. Next slide. Uh, evergreen, happy engagement. So I feel like the industry, to be long-lasting and successful, it has to eventually evolve into that corner. And it'll take time, because usually people don't start, start on Core Drive 3. Next. So, uh, once, you, once you see that, we understand we, there's a time frame change. You have to kind of evolve from one to another. But if we stay at where we are, I have a feeling that at one point, things, will, things might crash. You know, might, people might see, oh, wait, people lost motivation. And, and to secure the growth of the gamification industry, I feel like the, the, the design methodology needs to improve and mature. Next. So in a summary, I think that in the, for the future, I think the term gamification may or may not last, depending on how the industry designs it. And sometimes it's just so ubiquitous that, like Gabe said, you don't need, you don't need to talk about it anymore. It's like you don't go on a website and say, whoa, this website is so Web 2.0. It's so amazing, right? You just kind of assume, like, oh, yeah, Ajax, you know, interactive experience. But either way, 
I believe the ability to motivate desired behaviors will always be useful, as long as our brains don't change that much. So whatever you're learning today, regardless of how, what happens to the industry, will be very useful. And I believe three people will always play games. I think that's never going to stop either. Cool. So that's, that's my quick uh, talk. And uh, I actually like to gather a, a Kickstarter uh, guest appearance video. So, so it's something called... Uh, Octalysis Prime, and I would like you guys to, in kind of three, say Octalysis Prime, and I'd like to add that to a Kickstarter project I'm launching. It's, it's super secret, so let's try that. Octalysis Prime, okay? Three, two, one. Octalysis Prime. Ah, awesome. All right. I'll let you guys know if, when it launches, if you, I guess, if you talk to me. Anyway, so that's the talk. If you want to learn more about the frame, next slide. Uh, again, you can, you can get my book um, over there. I guess I'll sign it. And I'm also doing a workshop, next slide, uh, in December online. It's a three-day workshop. Next slide. I'm almost out of time. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and if you use the discount World Game K WGC 2015, uh, you get a 40% discount, and you can email me if you forget this count. Okay, and I think that's the last slide, so thank you. I, we probably don't have time to answer questions, but I'll be back there signing books. Thank you okay. so much. Yuka Chao.